In this section, we'll talk about sexually transmitted infections, or STIs. Before we continue, though, I'd like to give you a heads up that some of the images found in this PowerPoint presentation, as well as in your textbook, do include some graphic images of genitalia that are infected with various diseases. So you can choose to just listen to those sections instead of actually watch your screen. The other thing that I'd like to note is there are many sexually transmitted infections, but again, this chapter just focuses on bacteria. So that's all we will focus on in this chapter. Of the sexually transmitted infections that are caused by bacteria, there are three that your book names. These include syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. Sexually transmitted infections, called STIs, are otherwise known as STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, or historically, venereal diseases, or VDs. That's because these diseases are primarily transmitted through sexual contact, either penis and vagina, or two vaginas, two penises, anally, or through oral sex. Now, because of antibiotic use, these three different bacterial diseases, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, are dramatically decreased compared to their historical prevalence. However, with the development and evolution of antibiotic resistance strains and the change in human behavior, where humans are becoming more lax with the use of condoms, we are seeing a rise in the incidence of these diseases once again. The first thing I want to review very briefly are the structures of the male and reproduct female reproductive systems. The male reproductive system, as you can see here, is comprised of a single tube known as the urethra that carries urine from the bladder as well as carrying sperm that originate from the testes. This single tube can be infected by these different bacteria that we're going to be talking about in this chapter. On the other hand, female reproductive systems have a separate tube that carries urine from the bladder. So this is the urethra here in the front that carries urine from the bladder. And then behind that, the reproductive organ, which is the vagina or birth canal. In the case of sexually transmitted infections, it's usually the vagina, but not as much the urethra that's infected by these STIs. <clears throat> A chart listing the different types of STIs caused by bacteria can be found in your book in Table 12.9. The first microbe that we're going to be talking about is syphilis. Syphilis is caused by the bacterium Treponema pallidum. And as you can see here, it has a very unusual structure. It is a spirochete, or one of those spiral-shaped bacteria. Syphilis is transmitted primarily through sexual contact, and once acquired, progresses through a series of three stages, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary syphilis manifests by an appearance of painless sores, called cankers, on the penis or on the cervix of the infected individual. The cervix, remember, is located in the space between the vagina and the uterus. So it's actually inside the female and is often undetected in this case. These cankers on the penis or the cervix disappear in about four to six weeks and give individuals the impression that, they, that their immune system has rid themselves of the disease. However, if the disease has remained untreated, thereby meaning no use of antibiotics, that individual will eventually progress to secondary syphilis. Secondary syphilis 
occurs throughout the entire body and can lead to rashes, especially on the palms and soles of the feet, which appear and disappear periodically over five year period. Individuals that progress to the secondary syphilis can eventually progress to tertiary syphilis, which is an advanced stage of the disease that develops over a 40 year time period, during which numerous organs and tissues, especially those of the cardiovascular and nervous systems, show degenerative changes. Syphilis can dramatically impact the function of the heart and the brain and lead to cases of chronic heart disease as well as mental instability marked by periods of insanity. We will take a brief look at the symptoms of primary and secondary syphilis as shown in your book. Here, you can see the primary syphilis as the painless sore or canker on the penis and secondary syphilis, which are lesions and rashes on the back. In early stages such as this, syphilis can be treated with antibiotics to kill this spirochete bacterium. However, if allowed to progress to tertiary syphilis, even antibiotic treatment wouldn't be able to remedy the damage that has been done to those organs. Syphilis is not just acquired through sexual contact, however. It can also be transmitted from mother to child in a version known as congenital syphilis, in which case an infant is born of a woman that's infected with this microbe. Congenital syphilis is characterized by lifelong debilitations. And the best way to prevent congenital syphilis from occurring is to test every pregnant woman for syphilis. Diagnostics of syphilis requires a blood test and there is no vaccine. However, if a blood test does show that a patient has syphilis, most cases of syphilis today can still be treated with antibiotics. The next microbe that we're going to be talking about is gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is sometimes referred to as the clap or drip, and that's because of its characteristic symptoms, as we will see in this next picture of a patient infected with gonorrhea. Here, there is a picture of the male penis that has discharge due to the microbe that causes gonorrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea. This microbe, like syphilis, has humans as the only reservoir, and so can only be transmitted sexually from person to person. Gonorrhea is also known to infect not just the reproductive organs, but also the urethra in women. It can lead to pain in urination and pus containing drip from the urethra. Gonorrhea is also seen on the rise primarily because there, it is part of a list of superbugs that have readily evolved antibiotic resistance over the last 50 years. There is an increasing proportion of gonorrhea bacteria that can resist antibiotics commonly prescribed to patients infected with this disease. Alternative antibiotics are still effective against treating gonorrhea, but in the future, this may become less and less possible. All the more reason for increasing campaigns to promote safe sex, use of male condoms, and abstinence. In some individuals infected with Neisseria gonorrhea, they develop pelvic inflammatory disease, which is characterized 
by abdominal pain and possibly sterility. Gonorrhea can also be transmitted into the eyes of newborns during delivery, causing damage to the eyes and possible blindness. This is a condition referred to as ophthalmia neonatorum. Antibiotics applied to newborns directly to their eyes just after birth is an effort to minimize this risk. Finally, our third bacterium that causes sexually transmitted infections is chlamydia. Chlamydia is caused by the bacterium Chlamydia trachomatis and generally doesn't cause symptoms in most individuals infected by it. It is the most common bacterial STI. Your book misstates that it is the most common STI. But there are other viruses that are sexually transmitted that are far more common than chlamydia. The disease is particularly prevalent in young adults and teenagers. Many of them, as I mentioned, are unaware that they're even infected because most don't show symptoms. However, you can get tested for chlamydia using urine tests by simply peeing into a cup you can test for the presence of this bacterium. Chlamydia, again, because it's a bacterial disease, can be treated with antibiotics. An important measure, especially in the case of pregnant women with chlamydia, because again, newborns that acquire chlamydia in the birth canal can become blind as a result of the infection. From there, your book then progresses to diseases known as contact diseases, diseases that are transmitted from human to human contact other than STIs, which are transmitted primarily through sexual contact. We're gonna be going over three of these, starting with peptic ulcers. Peptic ulcers are actually caused by a bacterium known as Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori was not used to be thought as the cause of peptic ulcers. Stomach ulcers used to be thought as a result of poor diet and stress. However, as a result of efforts by Barry Marshall in Australia, who eventually won the Nobel Prize for this discovery, we now know that it is caused by a bacterium and can thus treat stomach ulcers with simple antibiotics. The reason why it was so confusing that Helicobacter pylori was the cause of ulcers is that many people actually carry this microbe in their stomachs. Helicobacter pylori survives the harsh acidic environment of the stomach and does this using an enzyme called urease, which breaks down urea, making it a lot easier for the microbe to live in the body. Helicobacter pylori can then live in the highly acidic environment of the stomach and in some individuals can lead to the development of ulcers. We do not fully understand why some individuals generate ulcers from Helicobacter pylori and others do not, but we do know that the result of Helicobacter pylori infections can be ulcers and a treatment for them is antibiotics. One way doctors diagnose Helicobacter pylori infections is looking for antibodies in the stomach, culturing microbes from biopsies from the stomach, or a breath test where the patient breathes into a container and the exhaled air is tested for urease. As I mentioned, Helicobacter pylori is fairly common worldwide found in about 70% of the worldwide population and 30 to 40% of the United States population. Interestingly, long-term Helicobacter pylori infection is associated with the development of gastric cancer, the second most common cancer worldwide. Next, in our next section, we'll be talking about two other contact diseases, starting with leprosy.